Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Welcome this morning. We've gathered together in the presence of one another and in the presence of God by his Holy Spirit to search those judgments, to, to, uh, to follow those paths. And in this spring semester, to hear the stories of those who have been sought out by God, who have been kept by him, and who are still remaining Christians. And uh, so we're, we're thankful for that and for the opportunity we have to hear those stories, to, to con consider how our own life story connects with these that we're hearing as well. So welcome this morning. You've braved all kinds of uh, natural disasters. You've maybe avoided the, uh, the hail across, across campus and all of that. For those of you who are online, we're glad that you're able to join us this morning as well. I'd like to announce another, um, another um, installment in our apologetics series, our Thursday at 11 o'clock online on Zoom. Um, uh, this Thursday, we'll hear from Lisa Fields. She's the founder of the Jude 3 Project, their mission, helping you know what you believe and why. And Ms. Fields will be uh, speaking on lessons from the black church, engaging society through apologetics. So we encourage you to find that Zoom link. It's posted in the TIU newsletter and, um, and, and join, uh, join us as we hear from Ms. Fields. Today, our, um, our speaker, who is still a Christian, is Dr. Craig Ott. We look forward to hearing from him. Dr. Lawson Younger will pray for us and with us. Dr. Alice Ott will read the scripture. And we're thankful for Kazukaya and Joseph Chan for leading us in, uh, in singing this morning. Would you stand as we together uh, um, engage this call to worship from the opening verses of Psalm 103? You'll read the part in bold. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles in that restored youthful energy. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you at the center of it all. The center of it all. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it'll always be, it's always been you. Jesus, Jesus, nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do, Jesus. 
Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you at the center of it all. Center of it all. Jesus, be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. And every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you at the center of it all. At the center of it all. We fall down. We fall down, we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. Greatness, the greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy. Holy, we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. We fall down. Jesus, the greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. be seated. Please join me in prayer. O oh Lord, creator of heaven and earth, king of the universe, who are we that you are mindful of us? Yet in your divine timing, 
you have sent your Messiah Jesus, who is the express image of your personage, the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He demonstrated his anointing by preaching good news to the poor, cleansing lepers, giving sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, even raising the dead. Yet he pronounced on more than one occasion to men and women, your sin, your sins are forgiven. What a mighty God, what a Prince of Peace. This morning, O oh Lord, give us ears to hear your word and eyes to see your work in our lives as your servant this morning proclaims your word. May we worship you in truth and spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke 7, 18 to 28. Luke 7, 18 to 28. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who's to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Good to be with you. And uh, for those of you who are online, Good to see you indirectly, I guess. Anyway, uh, I'm so pleased to be able to speak to you this morning. A few years ago, one of our PhD students, Michael Lee, <clears throat> wrote his doctoral dissertation with this title, From Faith to Advocacy, From Faith and Advocacy to Unbelief and Defection, Exploring the Concomitants and Consequences of Deconversion Among Evangelical ministers, and missionaries. Now, our chapel series is under the theme of why I'm still a Christian, and Dr. Lee was investigating the question, why are some pastors and missionaries not still Christians? His research was based on interviews with 25 different former pastors and missionaries who had left the Christian faith. Now, ministers and missionaries are not supposed to lose their faith. They're supposed to help others and strengthen their faith. And, and they're supposed to be the ones to fight through their questions and doubts and encourage others to do the same, right? Not always. 
The dissertation's not an edifying read, but it is instructive. The reasons why these people left the Christian faith were very different. They, they had a lot of different underlying reasons, but for most of them, it was not a single crisis. It was a process of questioning a gradual erosion of their confidence in God and Christ and in the Christian faith. Until finally they came to that point to where they, quote, had to be honest with themselves and couldn't believe anymore. Maybe you know people, maybe you even know a pastor or missionary who's gone through that process. Sooner or later, all of us have doubts, I think. And there's all kinds of reasons for this. Uh, churches and Christians behaving badly. Pastors who turn out to be hypocrites. Questions from the Bible about miracles or seeming contradictions or the creation story or how God dealt with the nations and judges and so on. Often it's a personal crisis, a sickness, a death of a loved one. And why didn't God answer the prayer and why does God let that happen? And sometimes it's just an ongoing spiritual dryness that God just doesn't seem to be there. The psalmist expressed that sense of abandonment by God in Psalm 77 where he says, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? He wrestled with these questions. Just God didn't seem to be doing a very good job of being God. Now I'll get to my personal story later. But I want to first look at this passage which we had read for us from Luke uh, chapter 7. It's really an interesting passage, in some ways maybe a little disturbing, like my topic today. <laughs> so we find John the Baptist, he's in prison, we know that from Matthew's version of this story. <clears throat> and there it's uh, John's disciples had told him about all these things. Jesus had just risen somebody from the dead. And calling two of them, he's, he, John, sent him to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect somebody else? Now that little phrase, the one to come, that was a fairly standard Jewish way of speaking with the Messiah. Jesus, are you the Messiah? Or should we wait for somebody else? He's having his doubts, his questions. Is Jesus really the one? So from this passage, I want to look at three surprises and then four practical applications. The first surprise, even spiritual giants may wrestle with doubt. Now, John the Baptist is probably the last person I would expect to be doubting the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. And didn't Jesus say in this very passage we just read, verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Really? I mean, greater than Moses? Greater than Abraham, the father of the nations? Yeah, that's John, spiritual giant, title qualifies. And yet, he's having his questions, his doubts. I mean, this is John, whose birth was announced by an angel, who Jesus describes here in this very passage, what was his calling? I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. That was John's calling to prepare the way for Jesus, the coming Messiah, that's why he's born. And he was filled with the Spirit in his, his mother's womb. And you remember the story when, Jesus, who's, uh, when Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus, enters the room. He's still in Elizabeth's womb, and he jumps. I mean, imagine this. And then it's John the Baptist who, when he sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who 
takes away the sin of the world. I mean, how's that for identifying who Jesus is? And in case that's all not enough, at Jesus' baptism, John witnesses the descent of the Holy Spirit on Jesus like a dove. He hears a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love with whom I'm well pleased. And now he's just heard in this very passage reports of Jesus raising someone from the dead. Now, John, why are you doubting the identity of Jesus? This is a surprise. And all I can say is if, if John had his doubts, you may have your doubts too. disciples had their doubts. That doesn't surprise me too much. You know, doubting Thomas. Uh, we know in 1 Timothy of Hymenaeus and Alexander who rejected the faith, who suffered shipwreck, shipwreck of their faith. You see that in the Bible. Even prominent pastors, as we've heard this study, and, and as we heard last week, Joshua Harris, former leader in the Gospel Coalition and Sovereign Grace Ministries, author of best-selling I Kissed Dating Goodbye, he Christ, uh, kissed Christianity goodbye. But John the Baptist, there he is sitting in prison, and he's beginning to wonder, is Jesus really the coming one? I mean, hadn't Jesus quoted that passage in Isaiah about setting the prisoners free? That's what he came to do? And here I am sitting in prison. But more than that, hadn't Jesus, wasn't he the one that was going to exercise judgment? Wouldn't he fulfill that part of the Old Testament prophets too? And hadn't John himself prophesied his winning for, winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with punchable fire. So where's that? Where's the judgment of evildoers? Where's the restoration of Israel? Where's the kingdom in fullness? I mean, isn't that what I was proclaiming that you were coming for, Jesus? Where is all that now? That's the first surprise. Second surprise. Jesus does not rebuke him for having little faith. In fact, we just read, he said, John is, he didn't say, well, I guess John's not the greatest anymore. And no, after that, he says, no, John is, he's, he's the greatest of the prophets. And that the people who don't take offense at me, they're even greater than him. So go figure. Jesus does not condemn John. He doesn't rebuke him. You know, he, and this is kind of funny. One of my questions here is, uh, you remember Jesus rebuked the disciples for having little faith. Uh, I'm thinking of the story where they were, they were in the boat and the storm came up. And, and the boat is sinking. I, I mean, and, and Jesus is sleeping. They had never seen Jesus calm a storm. I mean, he maybe healed somebody, cast out a demon. But, but I mean, this is an existential challenge they're facing. And then Jesus says, you have little faith. Okay. He doesn't say anything like that to John. But he had every reason on earth to know, not just by faith, but to really know that Jesus was the Messiah. And he doesn't say, oh, John, you of little faith, um, don't you know who you're supposed to be? Don't you know you're supposed to be preparing the way for me? Don't you know you're supposed to be pointing people to me? And what you're doing right now actually might be turning people away from me. None of that. That was the second surprise. Third surprise, Jesus answered to John. Now, that could have been pretty simple, I would think, right? You know, it's where Jesus just says, okay, John, yes, I'm the one. Wouldn't that have been fine? He doesn't say that. And you know, he almost never did. Um, now, there's a little backstory in this. According to Richard Longnecker, a New Testament scholar, he, he has argued from the hist other historical documents that the Jewish expectation was that the Messiah would not come proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, but rather would come doing great works that would lead others to acknowledge his Messiahship. So that was the expectation of what a Messiah would, would say and do. 
And of course, that's exactly what Jesus answers in verse 22. Go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus doesn't say, I'm the Messiah. Jesus doesn't say, right, John, you've waited long enough. I'm going to deliver you out of prison. Jesus doesn't say, yep, kingdom's coming. Just hold on and all those evildoers are going to be judged. Rather, Jesus just lists what he's been doing, these signs. No, the kingdom wasn't all the way there yet. But we see these signs of what we call the inauguration or inbreaking of the kingdom through the person of Jesus. The curse of sin is being overturned. The power of Satan is being broken. The grip of death is being overcome. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. By the way, good news is preached to the poor. That wasn't particularly miraculous, but it was a sign. And Joel Green calls this a symphony of Isianic echoes and in substance, a festival of salvation. That's what Jesus is bringing. But it's not all the way there yet. See, what I think Jesus was kind of saying here is, John, your situation's dire, but there's something bigger going on here than you. Step back a moment. Look up. Rethink your expectations. Interestingly, those signs that Jesus are listing had just been reported to him. He had probably eyewitnessed them. You see, what John needed was not new information. He needed affirmation, and he needed it from Jesus. Not enough. The others just reported it. I'll come back to that point in a minute. And that brings us really then to these applications I want to make from this. Four applications, especially when we're sort of wrestling with doubt. And the first one is this. Face your doubt. I find it interesting that John did not hide this doubt. Um, I mean, wouldn't that have been kind of embarrassing for him? I mean, he had come proclaiming Christ as the Lamb of God, and he was baptizing people and preparing the way, and then he, of all people, goes, hey, would you go double-check a minute, um, see if I got that right? I mean, he's supposed to be a spiritual leader, right? And yet, he puts it out there. He faced it. He dealt with it. You know, some doubts are passing. They kind of go away on their own. Some are just kind of an irritation. They're bothersome, but they're not existential. But then sometimes there's those doubts that really go to the core of our faith. And we need to deal with them. We need to address them. We don't want them to be like those reported in that dissertation I mentioned who have that slow erosion, like, like the foundation of a house crumbling, crumbling over time, little by little, till the house finally collapses. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus just answers. That's the first takeaway for me. It's okay, even for great people like John the Baptist or the psalmist or Job to have questions and to bring them out. Second, practical takeaway for me is go to Jesus with your doubts. Now obviously we can't send messengers to Jesus the way John did. But one thing, he, he didn't go to the Pharisees and scribes and for an alternate opinion about Jesus. He'd already heard about the works of Jesus from his disciples but he needed to hear it from Jesus. See, I think that there are some questions that can be answered by apologetics took a lot of apologetics and philosophy and religion courses here at TEDS. I was a philosophy minor in college. But my observation is that most people who are doubting with, uh, wrestling with this existential doubt, it's, it's not about the rational arguments. 
it's usually something more personal, more existential in nature. And God invites him to seek after him for assurance. There's a great promise in Jeremiah 29, 13, where God says to his people, if you will seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. That is a promise you can bank on. Jesus said similar things. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open. Now, my story goes this way. I grew up in a family that didn't believe in God. My father didn't believe in God. It wasn't particularly philosophical. He didn't finish high school. And if there was no good reason to believe in God, I didn't believe in God either. In fact, it seemed like there might be some good reasons not to believe in God because when I was 12 years old, my father passed away after a 10-year battle with cancer. The world didn't seem to be a particularly friendly place, and if there was a good God, he wasn't a very good one. So no, I didn't believe in God. I knew absolutely nothing about the Bible. The most I knew about the Bible, believe it or not, was from seeing the Hollywood movie Ben-Hur. You know, <clears throat> I didn't know if Moses lived before or after Jesus. If you'd said to me, let's read something from the New Testament, I would have said, who died? You know, Testament, you know, last will and testament? That's... If you'd asked me, what are the epistles? I would have said, I don't know, wives of the apostles? I, I, not a clue. I really didn't know anything. I had some Catholic friends, and in their house, they would typically have a crucifix on the wall, and that little man on the cross didn't mean anything more to me than Ganesh, statue of Ganesh, or a, or a happy Buddha. It's just a symbol. But I can tell you, especially when my father passed away, life was a really dark and hopeless place. And when you don't know God, and you don't even know if there's a God, it is a very dark place to be. The uh, groundbreaking physicist Stephen Hawking, author of Brief History of Time, he claimed in an interview this, <clears throat> the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. Now, if I had heard that, I probably would have said, that's right, that's about it. Just chemical scum. You see, if there's no God, we are not left with much more than that. And for me, that was a logically inescapable reality. If there is no God, what is the meaning in life? And even feelings of love and importance can be just reduced to some kind of chemical reaction going on in, inside my brain. But if there is a God, that changes everything. And that was also a logical conclusion that made sense. I just didn't know if there was a God. But things started to happen. Uh, cutting the story here a little short, I, this was the days of the Jesus movement. And there were people who were meeting Jesus whose lives were so dramatically turned around. One of my friends who was very much involved in the Hollywood scene, I grew up in Los Angeles, spent a lot of my weekends getting into trouble in Hollywood. And he was involved in bands and took a lot of drugs and had a really messed up life. He found Jesus. His life was so dramatically changed, I just had to take this seriously. It didn't just seem like some kind of psychological trick. They gave me a book. It was a Harmony of the Gospels. And I read that, and I thought, this is the most bizarre thing I've ever read. This is like science fiction. You know, there's miracles and demons. and I mean, it was just like another planet. Fascinating, but... But I did pray that Jeremiah 29, 13 kind of prayer. God, if you're there, I want to know it. And I want to know you. And God answered that prayer. 
Not too long after my freshman year in the university, state university, I was invited to a meeting. There was a speaker about fulfilled prophecy from the Old Testament. And that really got me thinking, so this book is really different from the Gita's or other religious books? There's really a reason to believe that there's truth here? It's not just a myth? And through a number of other events, it just became increasingly apparent to me a deep conviction. There is a God. The Bible is truth. And Jesus is the way. And that's how I became a Christian. And that's how everything changed in my life. And that encounter was so real that I've never doubted it. When we have doubts, we can pray that kind of, we can go straight to Jesus, we can pray that kind of prayer. God, reveal yourself to me. God, deal with my doubts. I believe he will answer that prayer. John didn't need new information. He needed a new encounter with Jesus, and sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need that conviction of the Holy Spirit that's described in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We can't totally explain it scientifically. We just know it. Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I think that apologetics and rational arguments and so on, evidences can be really helpful. They can only really open the door to faith. They can only really remove some of those obstacles to faith. But they will never totally answer those existential questions about faith. We need an encounter with the living God. Face your doubts. Go to Jesus with your doubts. Third, allow God to be God. <laughs> You see, our doubts often come because God is not behaving in a way that we think God should behave. And I think that's part of, a big part of what John's doubts were. The way God is acting, the way the world is going, does not make sense to us. And of course, why would it? Because God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's eternal, he's inscrutable. And Jesus wasn't fulfilling John's expectations, he doubted. Isaiah 55 says, for my thoughts, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So why do you think you would be able to figure out why God is doing everything the way he does? Romans 11:33. oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. G.K. Chesterton said, we need to approach our understanding of God as would a poet, not a mathematician. And I quote from Chesterton, the poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It's the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and the head splits. Now, I gladly quote that as somebody who was an under undergraduate mathematics major. We're not going to figure God out. And if we could, he wouldn't be God. So let God be God, and that's a good thing that we can't figure it all out. Relax. Relax. And I know that's hard when you see something awful happening or you're experiencing it yourself. We don't usually get the answer to the why question, but we can get the answer to the who question. Let God be God. And then the fourth thing, keep the big picture in view. See, I don't think it's going to be a particular answer to prayer, a particular deliverance, a healing. I don't think those are the things that really are going to make the big difference. It's not when God does what we want him to do that suddenly our doubts disappear. I think the answer 
is more than getting the big picture. And this is what I think Jesus was saying as he listed what was happening with his coming into the world. Get the big picture. The kingdom is breaking in, just not the way you were hoping it would. Not yet, at least. So don't be distracted by the bad behavior of some Christians. Don't be tripped up by some seeming conflict with modern science or some seeming passage of the Bible that's hard to to get. Don't be befuddled by a philosophical argument that attempts to rationally comprehend the incomprehensible. See the larger picture, that incredible story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and how that so perfectly fits our human experience and what we see in the world. It's the most beautiful story ever told. Not long ago, I was speaking with a family member who's not a believer. And instead of trying to go into a bunch of rational arguments, I just sort of told that simple story, that that just big picture Bible story. And at the end, she said, that's just beautiful. And it is. We need to keep that big picture in mind. That's a story that gives meaning to our lives. And I can tell you the alternative narratives don't. I've been there. So making sense of this world without God is like trying to make sense of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony through a statistical analysis of the notes on the sheet music. It won't work. Hear the music. See the beauty. Experience the wonder. And so when I've sometimes had doubts, even when Jesus didn't seem real in my life at the moment, I've come back to this. The changes in my life and the lives of others were simply too undeniable. The truth of the Bible was simply too compelling. The eyewitness reports too irrefutable. The fulfilled prophecies too inexplicable. The cumulative case too irrefutable. But the story was too beautiful. And so you may be experiencing personal difficulties or doubts. But that's the reason why I'm still a Christian. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we are not merely scum on a little insignificant planet in the universe. But you are the creator God. You are love, you are righteousness. And you have made us with purpose to know you. We thank you that you included this story in scripture of of a great man who doubted. And how you answered him in such a simple, yet sometimes enigmatic way. Will you speak to our own hearts in those times when we have our doubts. Lead people across our path who can help us, and most of all, may we search for you with all our heart and continually find you. Amen. Let us all stand and respond in worship. Can 
change the leper spot and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as May the Lord of peace himself give you peace in every way and at all times. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's go in that grace as messengers of that peace. Amen. <laughs>